an unknown person who signed his articles with the pen name Yazoo, wrote a number of pieces in the 1840s for the Spirit of the Times, an extremely popular New York-based magazine that covered among a wide variety of things, hunting and fishing. No one seems to know who this Yazoo was, but he left us some wonderful pictures of life on the old southwestern frontier. In 1843, the Spirit published Yazoo's submission, Trout Fishing in Mississippi, about his angling experiences on a bio near Yazoo City. In 1866, another pseudonymous author, writing as Raven, published a piece in the turf field and farm, giving a little more insight on the sport of catching trout in the Mississippi Delta, this time on what he called simply the bogue, most likely the bogue falaya in the Delta's Washington County. If you enjoy these stories, check out our website, canebreaks.com, soon to be redesigned and to receive some new material. Also, please like this video, comment, and subscribe. Thanks for listening. Trout Fishing in Mississippi, the last day of the season. On the 27th day of October last, the weather being warm and dry, I was tempted to try the trout, and as it turned out, for the last time this season, the weather since that time have been so cold and wet as to render any further efforts in that line fruitless until the low water of next summer and autumn. Armed with my box of snoods and extra lines, and the native cane which I cut from a neighboring break some two years since, with a regular and delicate taper, or straight as an arrow and supple as whalebone, and which, by the by, I would not give for the best two Conroy ever sold, I mounted my Leviathan filly about sunrise, and after an hour's lapse found myself upon the margin of Bio Tokeby, a small stream connecting the Yazoo River with one of the large lakes which lie in the great delta formed by the intersection of the Yazoo and Mississippi rivers. This bio is not a murmuring brook, such as are to be found in the York State, but its waters from July to November are as pure and clear as though they gurgled from the gorges of the Catskill Mountains. From the time I arrived at the fishing ground until eleven o'clock, I amused myself by taking from the surface of the water some fifty or one hundred minnows, which as I took them dropped into a small tin bucket half filled with water in order to preserve their life and freshness until wanted for bait. This is the natural food of the trout, and consequently the best bait for them. Artificial flies are pretty things when well made and like all imitations, do very well when the real article cannot be procured. For every fly or grasshopper a trout takes in the way of food, he swallows at least a thousand minnows. It is therefore clear to my mind that minnows are the best bait for trout. If gentlemen, by way of grandeur, will persist in using flies instead of minnows for taking trout, let them do so, but let them also preserve their consistency and shoot deer with a pistol instead of a double-barreled manton or Kentucky rifle. But give me the rifle and the minnow, and I will have venison and trout for dinner when they will go supperless to bed. So much for the minnow. But before I leave the little fellow, I must tell you how to take him. You have, of course, a miniature rod with a single thread for a line with a tiny hook thereon. To this hook, after killing him by a smart slap in the hand, you attach one end of an earth or red worm, leaving the other end to dangle on the surface of the water, where it is instantly swallowed by a minnow, or as it is frequently called, a topwater, which you can softly lift from the water, and after disengaging him from the worm, drop him into the bucket by your side. Thus may hundreds of them be taken by a single line in the space of an hour. You attach them to the hook by inserting it just below the dorsal fin. Here the muscles are the strongest, and the least vitality exists, so they will live longer and be less likely to get off the hook than if transfixed in any other part. With the seaweed line and a number one limerick thus baited, 
and the rod I have described, I commenced operations, and in a couple of seconds from the time my hook touched the water, I had hooked a three-pounder, who was played beautifully without a reel, and safely landed. This delightful sport I continued for three hours, during which time I took 44 trout, ranging in weight from one and one-half to three and three-quarter pounds. Two of them grazed four pounds each. If you can beat this with your flies and Conroy rods, just open the school in the Croton Reservoir, and I will come on and take lessons. A friend who is at my elbow accompanied me on this day's sport and took four fine trout and killed several brace of ducks, preferring the latter sport to fishing. Or perhaps he might have been as successful with the trout as I was. Signed, Yazoo. Fishing in this vicinity. Written for the Turf, Field, and Farm by Raven. In the heart of the muddy Mississippi swamp flows a beautiful stream, remarkable for its clear and pellucid waters. Amid cypress sloughs and boggy bios, where all else is sluggish or stagnant, lies the lovely Bogue, with white sandy beach and waters as silvery and sparkling as those of the Zumbro. This stream is the fisherman's paradise of this section. Standing upon the point of sandbar where it makes out, you can see deep down the crafty trout, watching with wistful eyes the little shiners that play in the shallows. Woe to his minnowship if he venture beyond his depth. In fishing from the bank, it is necessary to use a rod 16 or 18 feet long. A stout, plaited silk line is the best, with single gut length, armed with a limerick salmon hook, number three. For convenience in handling and baiting, the entire line should be the same length with the rod. Use no sinker, but three feet above the hook have a float of such size that it cannot be carried under by the minnow bait. On account of the hidden snags and sunken logs, it is impossible to use the reel and running line. For the same reason, it is necessary to have the line stronger than the gut length. Otherwise, in case of a strain and a blind gudgeon, there would be no telling where the tackle would break. And now I imagine city folk taking up their baskets, putting back their fancy rods into canvas cases, and turning homewards with a sneer because they cannot use their reels or fish in a certain particular way. Go on, lads. I'll have my fish without you. I know more than one would-be sportsman who cannot shoot unless they have a particular gun with particular kinds of ammunition, and who cannot fish with any other than their customary tackle and after a standing fashion. All such, God bless them. As for myself, I shoot and fish from the pure love of the sport. Show me a bog where there is a snipe or a stubble with partridges, and I will bet on having sport with them, even with a single-barrel flintlock. Or place me beside a stream with fish, and I can manage to extract enjoyment even with a pin hook and hazel twig. The double-barrel mantons and jointed conroys are delightful adjuncts to sport, but not absolutely indispensable. I have two rods which I would like to show to Pritchard Brothers of Fulton Street, if it were convenient. They are the natural growth of cane, beautifully tapering as straight as any jointed rod, and much lighter, stronger, and more elastic. Run the eye from the butt to the tip. There is not a bend or crook in either rod. They are still as straight as a needle, though used for several seasons, and there is no amount of strain that they will not bear. One is 16 feet, the other 17 feet long, weighing 1 pound 2 ounces and 1 pound 4 ounces. A jointed rod of that same length would weigh usually 2 pounds 8 ounces. Of course, the latter rod is much more convenient and even indispensable when traveling. But now to the banks of the Bogue. With a scoop net or number 12 minnow hook, I soon fill my bucket with shiners and choosing one of proper size, fix it upon the limerick by running the points through both lips from below. It is the best way of baiting for the fish for which I am going to cast, as he invariably strikes at the head. It is more usual, I think, to put the hook under the back fin of the minnow. 
Thirty feet from where I stand, the water of the bogue dashes with the rush of a mill tail over a log lying only a few inches below the surface, forming into whirls and eddies below. Into these whirlpools I cast my minnow, and as the float bears him along with the current, he swims around at the length of his tether. Suddenly he becomes frantic and attempts to get away, even leaping from the water to escape the oncoming foe. There is a rush of waters, a flounce, and even in midair he falls into the jaws of the black monster. How beautifully the ride lends itself to the sport, with the gradual bend from center to tip as the fish plunges and strains from the right to the left, and then runs straight away, trying to cast the hook from his jaws. Advance the butt of the rod and keep the point well up. If he once catches the line straight with the rod, both fish and tackle are gone. Again and again he rushes away, casting himself clear out of the water until finally subdued, he yields sullenly to the line and is towed to the sandy beach a four-pound trout. How beautiful he looks! The dark brown back and greenish bronze sides glistening in the sun. But what a villain his low forehead and long underjaw proclaim him. He died game, and the cook declares him worthy of capture. This is the game fish of our vicinity. First in the list of sport, inferior to few when properly served for the dish. He is common to most of our ponds and streams, selecting only the clear, as he has an abomination of mud. He is usually fished for as above with the live minnow, though he takes in certain seasons the shrimp and even the spring frog. I have also caught him with Buell's spinning bait and have occasionally tempted him to rise with the fly. Scarlet body with red ibis and silver pheasant wings. Wherever you find him, or with whatever implement you pursue him, he affords fine sport. He is no trout, the so-called, nor any kin to one, but a thorough, genuine black bass. Identical in all points and marks with the fish of that name caught in the lakes and streams of the north and west. In fact, there is no such fish as trout, nor is there a single representative of the salmon family in the extreme southern states. There is another fish called trout along the southern sea coast, a saltwater fish, which is also sometimes called speckled trout, from the large white longitudinal spots on his bluish-gray sides. It has the spinous dorsal fin, which is entirely wanting in the genuine trout. The correct name of this fellow is weak fish. He is frequently caught up to seven and eight pounds in weight, a fair fighter and a delicate dish. I think he would give great sport with the reel and long salmon line. I have never caught him except when fishing with hand line on the shell banks for large redfish. The striped bass, or barfish, is also taken in our streams and is fished for in the same manner as for black bass. They are constant associates in the same water and seem to be of the same habits in every respect. The black bass, though, I consider the gamer fish. In some book I have seen the striped bass described as a migratory fish attaining the weight of 60 or 70 pounds. With us, I am certain he never goes to sea, and five pounds is a whale. Fishing for bass, we also take the white perch of one and two pounds weight. This is, beyond question, our most delicate freshwater fish. A bold biter taking the minnow freely, but gives in very soon when hooked. Another associate of the bass is the lake sheep's head, locally called Gasper Goo or Goo. This is a beautiful fish to the eye, brownish gray above, silvery white on sides and belly. He is a bold feeder vigorous and gives good play at the end of a line, usually weighing five or six pounds. Beyond the sport in capturing, he is utterly worthless. Cook him as you may. His flesh, though white, is dry and slips off in great blocks or flakes. This fish is abundant in the south, is sometimes known as Falls Perch above Louisville, and I think Keen of the Louisville Hotel in the olden times, once introduced him through his bill of fare as white perch. 
It is customary to speak disparagingly of the catfish, Oregon trout, as General McMacken of the Washington House, Vicksburg, delighted to call it, and I suppose I ought not to mention them at all. The silver cat haunts only the clearest water, weighs usually three or four pounds, bites best at the live minnow, and pulls vigorously. I am individually very fond of the rich, gelatinous, well-flavored flesh. Such are the specimens of my basket after a morning's fishing at the Bogue. And as I view my two dozen bass, averaging two pounds, I congratulate myself as among those whose lines have fallen in pleasant places. The End Please do hit the like button for this video and subscribe. Thank you.